you have to actually do it because that's your responsibility then, is you actually have to do that. And your discipline will be about solving problems, not about suffering for problems, and about learning how to do things better in the future. Now, when we talk about discipline, if I, that should make sense to you. Like, every one of us as a parent, I'm going to tell you, you're here tonight because you love your children enough that you want them to become respectful, responsible, courteous, and considerate people. And that means, when you're in an environment like this, that you understand in your heart the concept of teaching people how to, how to behave appropriately. And, you know, I used to have the behavioral class at Prince Philip School, and we had 15 children in the room, ages 6 to 15 in the same room, which I asked for, by the way. I, I like it when we have a lot of ages. It's like a family, like a family, and you can get a lot of things across. But there was a young man in the room named Terry who was actually bigger and taller than I am, and he was quite difficult to deal with. He'd been uh, very aggressive when he first came. I worked very, very hard with him. I'm going to tell you, by his second year, he was doing the, the helping with the training of new students. He was doing orientation, even had a welcome wagon locker. Like when he went over the lift of supplies, if they were missing colored pencils, he would give them a gift of colored pencils. He had, he had a whole locker full of gifts that he could give to new students to make them feel welcome and go, here, well, you know, we're here for you. And despite how much he had grown, because I really relied on him, one day he disappointed me with how he made a rude comment, about, well, sorry, with how he handled a situation where another student made a rude comment about his mother. And he felt he should defend her honor, which I agree with, but not the way he did it. And I said, I've got to keep teaching here, Terry. Um, and frankly, I'm a little too upset right now. I've got to calm down. I'm pretty upset about what just happened. You go and sit at the back table, and you figure out how you're going to solve this. Now, will you notice the assignment I just gave him. Solve this. But he came from a school where it was all about punishment. So he comes up to me afterwards and he says, okay, Mr. Morris, again, I'm really sorry I did that. Um, I think I should miss the trip we're having on Friday. I went, what? Oh, no. No, I want you on that trip. You'll love it. And I, I designed it. You know, it's hard to find trips that interest such a wide range of people from age six right up to you. And plus, I need your help. You're like my teaching assistant. I don't want you missing the trip. I need you. The little kids look up to you. I said, I don't need you missing trips. I actually need you acting responsibly and solving this problem. Come up with a better idea than missing that trip. <coughs> he says, well, I could have a couple of weeks of detention. So I said, I've never used that word. And I keep people in school all the time to work on things after 3.30, but I've never played cop, I've never used the word detention, and I, you're thinking about your other school. So I don't need you sitting around in detention, so I need you behaving responsibly. And today, part of it is solving this problem you've created. So come up with a better idea. So he comes up with a couple more ideas just like that, and I said the same thing, and now he's getting really frustrated with me. And finally he looks at me and goes, well, I don't have any more ideas. The only other thing I could do is learn a better way to handle stuff like that. <laughs> he goes, oh, that's what you wanted to hear all along. He said, half of it. What's the other half? He goes, the other half? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, this is proof since it was written in the top left-hand corner of my blackboard permanently. Like I put it on in paint so it would never be rubbed off. It says, proof when the emotional brain winds up, it blocks the thinking brain. Because he had actually seen it every day of his life. I said, read what's in the top left-hand corner of the blackboard, Terry. He looks up and he goes, oh, yeah, make it right and learn how to do it better. Like, I don't need you punished. You've upset a lot of people. Now you've got a much harder job to do than to miss a school trip. You have to sit there and figure out how you're going to make this up to everybody that you've upset, including me. And then you have to learn how to handle the situation better in the future. Then we're done, and not until then. But that's completely different. Now, when you're doing the teaching of this, I want you to know, in parenting, that you're not a parent. I've got to watch my time, because there's no clocks. <laughs> time is so we have about 10 minutes, minutes. so we break for prayer, and oh. then we can resume. So you still have about 10 minutes. You'll hear the mic go on. What time is it? 10 to 8. Eight right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want to keep people all, you know, we've got little kids around, but, because we could talk all, you know, we've got tons of stuff we could talk about. You're not a parent until your kid's running around your home. 
like when we talk about parenting, you're not a parent until your child's about 18 months old. Up until then, you're a servant. <laughs> well, that's called nurturing a baby. And as a very interesting challenge that it sets up. Around the age of 18 months, every child gets an attitude. Because for the first 18 months, when the child cried, you went. And if he was hungry, you fed him. Dirty, you changed him. Wanted some attention, you picked him up and cuddled him and talked to him and sang songs to him. Nurturing is a wonderful thing. But you end up with a child who thinks the world revolves around him. And he'll think that he should get whatever he wants, when he wants it, just by demanding it. And the big people should come running and cater to him to keep him happy. Well, that's okay when he's 18 months. You're not supposed to let it go on forever. You'd end up with a teenager with an attitude you can't live with. So when he starts to run around the house, you have to change from being a servant to being a parent. And it takes a while, and it's hard work. And what you do is you start to set limits to protect their safety, so you'll let them know there are places they're not allowed to go and things they're not allowed to touch. And the moment you do that and set up gates and stuff, now you're parenting. And along with that, you're going to teach them to do things like following directions, to pick things up, put things away, to put his little hand in yours, to cross a parking lot safely, and things like that. And when you start to teach him to follow directions, you're teaching him who's in charge. I want you to understand the concept of in charge. There are a lot of techniques and discipline that are not complicated. They're just hard work. In charge establishes who gives the directions and who follows the directions. That's all. And the child has to grow up knowing by the time even he goes into kindergarten, the big person will be giving the directions, the little people will be following the directions. That's how this thing works. And when you teach kids how to follow directions, you're setting up the adolescent years for success so that when you say be home by 10, you're home by 10. That you come when I call you, which will be one of my directions. You come when I call you. So when I say be home by 10, be home by 10. And you're really deciding in the early years how things will run in the later years. Don't wait around until it's too late. Get, I, there used to be an, a, an, a Fram oil filter commercial that I love when it comes to parenting because it said you can pay me now or pay me later. Because what happens is some people skip the terrible twos by continuing to be a servant to their child and then they get the terrible teens. Mm -hmm. And when I'm dealing with difficult teenagers, what I'm usually looking at is two to four year old behavior. Me, 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 me. I want to do whatever I want to do right now and don't try to stop me or make me do something else or I'll blow up and, and uh, make your life miserable. And that's a temper tantrum. Now, in little children, those occur when you make the switch from being a, a servant to being a parent because what that does is it flips the child's world upside down from where we do what the child demands to where now the child has to do what we demand. Well, there are some children that just go with the flow on stuff, but most get very frustrated and spend the next 18 months trying to put things back the way they were. That's all that is. Stubborn, strong-willed children spend up to 30 months trying to put things back the way they were. And you can't give up on establishing the parent role and being in charge of children. Can't give up. I meet more and more people who are either giving up or trying to do something else. Like I meet mothers and fathers who instead of trying to be best parents, they now try to be best friends with their child. And because they're trying to be popular, they won't make unpopular decisions. Um, folks, if you're a good parent, there are so many unpopular decisions, your children will think you're unreasonable. I, I had a rule in my house, for instance, that requires my children to be polite to rude people. My kids thought that was ridiculous. <laughs> Just ridiculous. They said, why would we be, be, be polite to someone who's being rude to us? I said, because that's the kind of person I taught you to be. So the easiest thing in the world is to be polite to someone who's being polite. But when you have character and you take on the challenge of being a person of character, then you be yourself when somebody else isn't. Oh, well, wow. this, this, and this. And my, my young son says, well, you know, Dad, like, like, really, the in thing these days, if you watch television programs like we watch and so on, is to come up with a snappy, in-your-face, right-back-at-you comment to rude people. And I said, 
What's the rule in our house, son, that we now call the Las Vegas rule? He goes, I know, what happens on TV stays on TV. <laughs> and the language I hear on my MP3 player have to stay on my MP3 player. <laughs> I chalk you, son, the entertainment world to fantasy world. This is the real world. Don't I ever mix those two up. Entertainment world, snappy, in your face, right back at you, comment to rude people. Real world, you be the kind of person I taught you to be, and be polite. Oh, fine. He thought I was unreasonable, but then he got a part-time job working at McDonald's. Where he still is, by the way, as an assistant manager at the new one by the new <coughs> shopping mall of Glendale. He's out there. And you know what he had to learn in his training program at McDonald's? How to be polite to rude customers. <laughs> and when he told me that, I went, and you were thought I was unreasonable just because I wouldn't lower my standards below McDonald's. <laughs> and then you look around you at the world at large these days at how many people expect less of their children than McDonald's expects from someone serving burgers. And I really suggest to you that you raise your standards because children are capable of being fabulous people. It doesn't happen by accident, however. It's hard work and you set your expectations up and teach them. And, well, just one last example here. Uh, cause, uh, and if you're willing to come back, I mean, I can give you some really interesting information on the adolescent years and stuff like that too. And there are techniques in discipline I like, like bedtime will always be one of two things in your home. Bedtime will be a routine or bedtime will be an event. <laughs> Always one of two things. If you want it to be a routine, routines are patterns like telephone numbers, where if you are consistent enough with a little pattern of doing it, it becomes automatic and there's no arguing. All arguing comes from the thinking brain and the emotional brain. All routines come from back here, just like stopping at red lights, where you'll stop at red lights because you always stop at red lights. It doesn't matter if nobody else is coming the other way. You'll just come to a stop because it's one of your habits. And I love it when bedtime is a routine because that takes five to 10 minutes. As an event, it's an hour to an hour and a half. We have a lot of homes where everything's a big event. So, um, but let me just tell you something because if you're going to prayers, this is something you can pray about. So my third eldest son, Alex, who works at McDonald's, he actually always wanted to work at McDonald's. I've got a teacher, I've got a computer expert, McDonald's. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, I'm proud of all of them. So I'm sitting one day in McDonald's with him, which is ironic. He was about 14. I like to talk to my children about values before there's a problem, not when there's a problem. Before there's a problem, so they do things the right way. So I'm sitting there going, I have a question for you while we're sitting here. Supposing that I didn't come in with you today. Supposing I had an appointment, I said, go and have lunch. Here's $20, go and have lunch. I'll pick you up in a few minutes when I'm finished my appointment. You go in, you pay for your lunch, you take it to the table, you're sitting there, you have, you're looking at the change going, wait a minute, that's not right. And you have $5 too much change. I said, I'm gonna ask you what you would do with it, but I want you to know you're welcome to keep it. You didn't do anything wrong. The cashier was the person that made the mistake. She won't even realize she made a mistake until the end of her shift. And so she won't know who she gave it to. And I'm not even there, so I won't know anything about this. So frankly, you're welcome to keep it. So just tell me what you would do with it. He goes, um, I would take it right back to the cashier, explain to her she made a mistake, and hand it back. Now, you know, we all know that children learn what you expect and will feed you a line. <laughs> so I was ready for that. I went, oh, spare me. <laughs> I, oh, please, give it back to the cashier. Bearing. I'll tell you what, I'll change the question. Just tell me what you would spend it on. He looks at me and goes, that would be wrong. <laughs> Says, it's not my money, it's her money. For all I know, they take it out of her paycheck, which is true. Because McDonald's covers pennies, but not dollars. That's their rule. And he says, I don't care if she knows who got it or not, and I don't care if you're there or not. I would take it back to the cashier and give it back to her. I went, well, good for you, son, and I'm proud of you because you knew the right thing to do and you were prepared to do it without my being there, which is called self-discipline. That when I'm not there to make sure you do the right thing, which is discipline, 
when I'm not there to make sure you do the right thing, you were prepared to make sure you did the right thing. That's self-discipline, that you don't need me standing over your shoulder to conduct yourself properly. You don't need it to be babysat anymore. Good for you. And I said, plus, you stuck with the right thing under a lot of pressure to change your mind. Today, it was me doing my best to try to change your mind. In the future, it'll be some of your friends trying to change your mind. And I'm proud of you for sticking with that. But I do want to tell you, I asked 300 students in grade six, seven, and eight one day what they would do. And I told them first that if the cashier is short $5, they'll be working for half an hour for nothing. Because it'll be taken out of their paycheck. That's half an hour of work for nothing. And I said, if you were the cashier, what would you want? Everybody in the room said, we'd want the, the customer to give it back because we don't want to work for nothing. So I said, now you're the customer. And I want you to go, this is happening to you. You're the customer. What would you do? 260 out of 300 grade six, seven, and eight students said they'd keep it whether it came out of the cashier's paycheck or not. <laughs> 12 said they'd go right back up and see if she'd make the same mistake a second time. <laughs> <laughs> and 50% of them said their parents would keep it as well. Some of them explained that one of their parents, usually the mother, I'm not sure why that's true, but usually the mother would make them take it back. The father would say, put it in your, your piggy bank. <laughs> or they said, you know, both of our parents would make it, make us take it back. But nobody said their, fa their mother would say, keep it, and their father would say, no, you don't. Which was interesting. I, I have no explanation for that. I'm just letting you know. Now, we're in a mosque and we're in a place where values are important. And I'd like to think if you asked your children that you wouldn't get 260 out of 300 saying they'd keep that money. But you know, this is a very interesting world. I picked up several blocks of old cheese at the Ancaster Costco one day on my way back down here and realized when I got home in Font Hill that they'd only charge me for one. I'm not driving all the way back to Ancaster, that's ridiculous. I just put that receipt in my wallet. I said, I'll be going back there someday because one of my sons lives down there and uh, so it actually was six weeks before I got back down there because he was coming down to my place all the time and um, and so I popped in and I said I've got a, a little problem with the receipt here can I talk to the manager so the manager comes on and says I can't fix a receipt that's a month and a half old I said oh you can do this one <laughs> I said I bought three blocks of cheese you only charged me for one I'm sorry it took so long but I came in today to pay for the other two and he looks at me and goes you're kidding me, right? <laughs> like I've been doing this for 20 years. First. First time this has ever happened. Well, it's a shame, isn't it? But I sleep at night. And now I'm paying for the other two. Plain and simple. I got, you know, good grief. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to go that far. But surely, you know, the thing at McDonald's or whatever. Like, that was a little over the top. But then this is my business of teaching respect and responsibility and stuff like that. I kind of feel obligated to be a decent role model. <laughs> you know the feeling, right? It can be hard sometimes. Because you've got to be sort of up on top of it. So, but I, you know, that's the world. And I'm going to tell you, uh, children actually can become some of the most honest people around if you teach them to be. Because as adults, we get a little fed up with things and get a little jaded. I'm going to tell you, uh, I want you to have high expectations for our children because they are, for the most part, if you teach them to be great, they're fabulous. We have prayers. I'm willing to go for a few more minutes about adolescent behavior if you would like me to, if you want me to come back. If you can't come back, I want you to know, sure. I brought in a couple of sheets, I'm not sure if I've got enough for everybody. Brought in a couple of sheets, one on young children, one on adolescent children. And there's sure. on the end of the table up there. So if, you, if you can't come back for a few more minutes, then make sure you take one of those at the very least. So, so. after prayer. Sure.